In November of 2020, a night commercial was aired in Japan, portraying Japanese kids of diverse ethnic backgrounds suffering from bullying and harassment from their classmates. The commercial got about 10 million of views in a week and it predictably sparked some online controversy from Japanese commenters. While the reception was overwhelmingly negative, the comments and reactions were pretty varied on their arguments as to why they disliked the commercial. Some outright stated that the kind of thing didn't happen in Japan. Some said that the portrayal of Japanese people was overly negative. And some didn't actually dispute the idea that racism and discrimination existed in Japan, but they criticized Nike's hypocrisy on the matter, especially considering their history with slave labor, and also their holier-than-thou attitude. In an interview for the BBC News, author Steve McGuinness said, Endemic racism is going to be a sensitive topic in any culture, but Nike should not think, as a foreign brand, that it is appropriate for them to point it out to their hosts. And Japanese-American journalist Marley Robertson said that many Japanese do not like to be told by outside voices to change their ways. So, as a foreign myself, this should be fun. Let's get a few things out of the way. Critical race theory has been a field of study particularly significant to the continents of America and Africa due to obvious reasons. Most, not all of it, but most of the well-known intellectual and academic production concerning the subject has been made by people from such places and aimed at the cultural and social context of these specific places. However, that doesn't mean you would be wrong to apply the concept of critical race theory to Japan. Much like feminism or Marxism, it is a lens. A lens with which we can analyze basically whatever we want, even in a country that is seemingly as racially homogenous as Japan. Race, being a social construct, is, by the very definition of a social construct, subject to different cultural and social conditions. Being black in the US in 2021 is not the same as being black in the US in the 60s. Being black in the US is absolutely not the same as being black in Asia, for example. Consequently, and most predictably, racism also operates differently in diverse circumstances. It is expressed differently and it affects people, both marginalized and in power, in various manners, so it must be analyzed accordingly. In Japanese, the most appropriate word for race would be minzoku, but it's still not the most accurate. The multivocal nature of the word reflects the fact that ethnic, national, and racial categories rather vaguely overlap in the Japanese perception of themselves. The Japanese view of nation is very much an ethnic one. Japan's national identity has centered around the notion of the uniqueness of Japanese ethnicity shared by its members, a uniqueness which is a function of culture, religion, and race. This is not surprising at all, a lot of countries, even in the West, have some trouble distinguishing these concepts of nationality, ethnicity, and race. In the US, the word Latino, for example, can, in certain contexts, end up conflating all of these ideas into a single sentence, even if the meaning of the word might not actually relate to them. When Trump, or any United States president for that matter, says Muslims, we all know he isn't just referring to religious people or people from a specific country. It is an amalgamation of ideas. In the same vein, a country with an extensive fascist history needs to establish itself with a strong national identity. In such context, ethnicity and race are practically interchangeable, since what is actually important is to separate the us from the other doesn't really matter what form it takes or what vocabulary is used, what is important is to set a hierarchy where your people are at the top and the other is at the bottom. And so, it's no wonder that the very word Minzoku was coined during the Meiji Restoration era with the rise of the Japanese Empire. The history that covers the Meiji Restoration is long and complicated and extremely bloody and violent. 
Between the years of 1868 and the Second World War, Japan, in its process of expanding and becoming a colonial power, much like its peers from the West, set up colonies all around Russia, China, and Korea. And these colonies, like any other colony in the history of the world, were governed with erasure of native culture and extreme violence. What is important for us to note at this moment is that a lot of individuals from these colonies were moved into Japanese territory, and it's a sad and interesting process for Korean and Chinese people specifically, because some were actually assimilated into the workforce and the Japanese military. For that to occur, they were granted citizenship and other social benefits. However, after World War II, the Empire of Japan fell, colonization was seized, and Korean and Chinese immigrants from that time were stripped from their citizenship. A lot of them had already established their lives there. They had families and jobs and couldn't just go back to their country of origin. By 1950, under the revised nationality law, People who decided not to leave Japan were registered again as foreigners. They would be, quote, frequently fingerprinted, forced to carry officially issued identification at all times, and legally subjected to instant police questioning at any time or place without probable cause. To this day, there is still some discrimination against the Zainichi, which are the descendants from those immigrants of colonization times. A lot of them are pressured into adopting Japanese names and they may also suffer discrimination in the workplace or bullying in schools, like in the night commercial. The major restoration was also a very tough time for the indigenous groups of the region. The Ainu are the most well-known indigenous group of Japan. They occupy the region now known as Hokkaido, and they already had a relationship with the Japanese and seemingly friendly at that since commercial trade was common between the two peoples. Once the empire was established, however, colonization started taking place as mainland Japanese emigrated to Hokkaido, and discriminatory practices displaced the Ainu from their traditional lands to the mountainous area in the island center. As they also began to be forcefully assimilated into Japanese culture, they were required to abandon their native language adopt Japanese names and were gradually stripped of their culture and traditions. Due to discrimination, many Ainu also hid their ancestry in order to merge more seamlessly into Japanese society. And today, a lot of Ainu culture has simply been lost, and the people who still do identify as Ainu are mostly poor and politically unrepresented. The Okinawans, or Ryukyuans, are another indigenous group from the Okinawa prefecture who share a very similar history. Their culture was also erased and suppressed, and their assimilation into Japan was in great part made by the educational system, which, much like the Nazis, preached for a kind of ethnic purity. Both of these groups also reportedly suffer from discrimination to this day, particularly in workspaces. Now, again, it is very likely that a Japanese scholar will not employ the term racism when talking about the history of the Empire of Japan, but honestly, I don't give a fuck. At this point, fascist and racism are basically synonyms. Now, when it comes to anti-black racism over there, it is hard to track it in an objective way, since it is not as noticeable. Not only is the black population there relatively small, but there also aren't as many statistics for us to study. Here in the West, it is sadly really easy to note anti-blackness through sheer numbers. Police brutality, housing, access to education, imprisonment, socioeconomic status, all of that can very easily be statistically measured some way or another. They almost always, and by almost I mean just always, reveal facets of racial inequality. But in Japan, such statistics don't really exist on record, which I guess can be considered a good sign. John G. Russell writes that awareness of the existence of blacks in the Japanese imagination first began to emerge in the mid and late 1980s. With the surge of Western media, and particularly North American media, a lot of black stereotypes and racist views were imported. Conservative politicians weren't shy of making racist remarks 
like the Prime Minister Nakasone Yasuhiro, who commented on the questionable hiring practices of US-based Japanese companies when it came to the blacks. And at the same time, hip-hop and rap started to gain popularity among younger people in the counterculture urban crowd. A lot of black culture influence, in fact, can be pinpointed to this day in music and fashion. However, all of those views and ideas were always held in such a way that black people were seen as outsiders, foreigners. The truth is that the existence of black people in Japan itself has only recently been recognized as a fact. If you search for the subject on YouTube, you find plenty of videos of black Japanese people telling their personal experience living in Japan. Their stories range from the day-to-day -day weird looks to bullying at schools. There is also the occasional exoticization and also just plain invasions of privacy, like people wanting to touch your hair, that one still happens in the West. All of that, while not being as harsh as in the US, is very much part of a racist societal structure. Bullying in schools can cause harm in the educational process. In general, dehumanizing treatment will always have negative influence over a group's self-perception and their overall experience in society. Interestingly enough, the theme for the 2020s Tokyo Olympics was diversity and inclusivity, so it is very likely that Nike's commercial was made to be in line with the theme of the Olympics. At the very least, it doesn't seem like Japanese people are completely unaware of such topics. But what does worry me is that diversity and inclusivity are great ideas as an aesthetic goal, not always for a political or social one. Japan has famously been pretty bad at recognizing its own fascist history. Korean and Chinese women who were sexually abused by Japanese soldiers still fight to this day to even be recognized by the Japanese government. And in fact, it was only in 2021 that some of these women received an apology and compensations after years of legal battles. If you are Japanese and or are a fan of Japanese history and you got angry at the use of the word racism to describe everything described here, then use another word, I don't care. What is important is to acknowledge the failings of a society that subjugated otherized groups for its own supremacist benefit. Acknowledgement is the first step, and after that, well, that's a conversation for another day. Thank you for watching this video, I have made a Patreon, yay. If you'd like to help me buy a mic so as not to make my audio so fucking bad every time, I would appreciate it. Thanks.